Lesser Light by Matthew Draper Chapter 7 Christmas Day. Scrumples was not the least bit interested in their Christmas stocking. I had filled the knitted sock with colourful packets of treats, their favourite cat nipples and toys. If I bodily lifted them off the nest they'd made out of a blanket on the sofa and dropped them feet first onto the stocking, it was possible they may stay long enough for a quick photograph to be captioned scrumple claws, but equally they might squirm away. I scooped them up for a big kiss on the head and set the cat free to scurry back to their nest. Message received, scrumps. Santa Claus do not stop here. I loved Christmas, so no amount of grumpy kitty behaviour was going to stop my effort to enjoy Christmas this year. Rocco was dressed and ready to go by the time I had finished fussing with scrumples. I could see he was dressed moderately, having washed all the blue out of his hair from the night before. He paired beige chinos with brown shoes and was scrubbed up in a plain white shirt. At least he did not have a tie on. Wait, yup, there it was, currently wrapped around his hand. It would be knotted in place before we got to his mum's house, and I would have to call him Richard for the day. Rocco's mum's met when he was five his having been born into the previous marriage of his biological mum, Brenda, and wannabe rock star, Frank. Brenda's current partner, Jennifer, moved to Tantony Edge after they met at a small business networking event in Leeds. Rocco's dad, Frank, would join us for Christmas dinner later. He had never remarried and remained fully involved in his son's life after the marriage broke down even living intermittently in the house with his ex-wife and Jennifer between gigs and tours as a guitar player. Now he lived about 20 minutes drive away in the nearest big town, Macclesfield, in a rented flat. You might assume a family which had been forerunners of progressive dynamics in family structure would carry such progressive views into every area of their life, However, in their case, a small to medium business attitude prevailed over unique structure, and they presented themselves, for the most part, as traditionalists, supporters of conservative politics on every other point. Brenda and Jennifer may well have voted for Tony Blair and new Labour, but would definitely have switched right back when the minimum wage increases were on the line in recent elections. I would never dare ask which way they leaned on Brexit, That debate had apparently never reached Tantony, or had been laid to rest before I arrived. Their 3D printing art business had been able to continue unimpeded during the pandemic, once minimum wage workers were allowed to return to site. I try not to follow all the ins and outs of the progressive versus traditional in their house. All I know is, Rocco becomes Richard the moment he steps through their door. Uh, Richard is lovely and all but a little more staid than the person who wore a knitted Smash the Patriarchy Christmas jumper with jingle bells sewn at nipple height to his workplace Christmas party. Jennifer is all teeth. She embraces us in the doorway with the kind of smile which announces from television screens that nine out of ten dentists recommend this brand of toothpaste. Brenda had hot chocolate simmering on the stove top and cook from frozen croissants growing into puffed up pastries in the oven. We would be expecting more and more guests before the day was out. Boots constantly stomped on the doormat, announcing arrivals. Scarves and coats were swung over the banister as the neighbours, neighbours' parents and neighbours' parents' neighbours all poured into the house throughout the morning, draping themselves all over the lounge furniture. In the front room, a huge pine Christmas tree reached from the floor to the ceiling where a giant star-shaped topper tapped against wooden panelling. Rows of bushy branches were adorned with 3D printed ornaments from previous year's collections. 
hanging by silver threads, were plastic post boxes in a variety of gaudy colours, and imitation stamps which boasted faces of Queen Elizabeth II from the many eras of her reign. Having bought a house next to a dairy farm in the village, Rocco's mums had developed a close friendship with their nearest neighbours, a farming couple. Traditionally, the farmer and his wife and their assorted relatives flooded into Brenda and Jennifer's for a welcoming Christmas morning drink and pastries before going back to the farm. Rocco's earliest memories were helping bring cows in from the fields to be milked, and he was a proper farmer boy in his teens, working with the neighbours until he studied a trade at college and eventually took a job fixing gas boilers in his twenties. The family's shared Christmas tradition had started when Rocco was little and continued every year as though nothing had changed. Clutching mugs of hot cocoa, young and old perched all over the long green sofa and matching armchairs in front of the tree. These were not my people. I bubbled with Christmas excitement, but you would not have known it to see me stood beside one of the armchairs, sipping at the super sweet cocoa. I had never known exactly how to interact with this crowd. I was not given a rule book upon joining the family. I still could not understand the in-jokes and hadn't studied up enough to find out. Every now and then, I attempted to interject with an interesting story, but it always came out too strong. At a previous family buffet over the Easter weekend, I had suddenly launched into the tale of Anne Lister and Anne Walker being married by taking communion together in 1834. I hadn't meant to burst in so abruptly. The farmer was talking about a wedding they were attending in the summer, so I thought it seemed the right moment to expand a tale of queer romance. But everyone stared at me as if I had thrown a glove down on the table and demanded a duel. Brenda and Jennifer, who had not openly fought for gay marriage, and once it was available had chosen to simply change their last names to match and brought life insurance that would ensure their company, house and inheritance would pass to one another, had awkwardly sipped their tea. The village may have been open to lesbian and gay relationships, but replacing traditional institutions like marriage with queer versions was considered a taboo subject. So this wedding is in July? Rocco's dad had diplomatically switched the subject back, and everyone carried on without me. In my time at St Michael's, one of my roles had been volunteering at a small group, under Morgan's directorship. At the Sky Gazers evening once a week, students and young adults brought food to share, read a Bible story aloud, and we chatted about methods to apply the principles of the story to each of our lives. Before dinner, we would each state the best and worst thing we had done that week. We knew each other's secret battles, personal feelings and failings, and external circumstances better than anyone. Whenever a new person joined our small group, each of us would ensure we spoke to them individually, asking about their family history, their connection to God, the movies and TV shows they loved or hated, and which subjects they were studying at university. We would never have let one of them arrive and spend the evening, let alone five years, feeling like an outsider. Of course, we also took their money and gave it to the church, reduced their confidence and personality, and encouraged greater and greater dependency on the group itself, rather than individuality. But I digress. I love Christmas. Even from the corner, I could feel the glow of the family's happiness. Cheeky comments rang out as they pulled open presents. I was not very good at buying presents for other people, so provided a lot of biscuits in novelty tins, from me to the farmers and farmers' relatives. A biscuit tin shaped like a Scotty dog! How imaginative! One of them exclaimed, unwrapping. It will go well with the polar bear tin from last year. But did I detect a side eye between the farmer and his wife? Brenda and Jennifer gifted everyone ornaments from their latest 3D printed collection. This year it was snow boots in a variety of red, white and blue patterns which, on some, looked suspiciously like a Union Jack. 
I tried to style my face to seem grateful, but not too grateful. I did not want to look either ungrateful or spoiled. Unwittingly, I thought about Dylan's speech in the changing rooms, about deserving nice things. I didn't want anyone here to imagine I thought I deserved nice Christmas presents. The thought of Dylan's speech, or maybe his closeness, flushed my face as I opened packets of socks, a quiz book I am guaranteed to never fill in, and a packet of Lady Gaga branded pink Oreos. Actually, those are pretty awesome. I waggled the packet at Jennifer with a thankful nod. She looked relieved to have picked out something I liked. She quite literally breathed out a sigh of relief and shared a smile with Brenda across the coffee table. Was I so difficult to be around? Someone had bought me an Anne Lister calendar with pictures from the TV series based on her life. My face, already flushed, deepened to a purplish red at the overcorrection. Had my little outburst of a story at Easter stayed with them so much they felt the need to buy something branded to placate me? I felt embarrassed. Conspicuous by their absence were any cards or presents from my own parents. Quietly, but forcefully Christian, throughout my childhood, my parents had been unlikely to react well to my coming out as gay in my late teens. My mum and dad had met at a youth camp for pastor's children and had been heavily influenced into thinking LGBT people were dangerous servants of Satan who would destroy the traditional family unit. I waited as long as I could to come out to them, but it had to happen one day, or I would never be able to date openly. Eventually, on my twentieth birthday, I wrote them a letter and phoned on the day they received it. A flaming row had left us not speaking ever since. I joined St Michael's only a few months later, running away from my old life. Unlike my parents, Morgan welcomed me as a diverse member of the family of God. We've been waiting to have a few gays on the team for some time, he had announced loudly when we first met. As volunteers, we were encouraged not to date at all, so we could give more time to serving God, but that was as true for the straight team as well as the gay team. Come to mention it, the straight team did seem to be on dates all the time, but only when they felt God had specifically called them to go out with one another, which was all the time. I touched my tongue to the dried cinnamon powder stuck to the rim of the hot chocolate mug. This tasted like Christmas to me. The rip of wrapping paper sounded like Christmas. The scent of pine rising from the tree each time someone dove under to pull out gifts smelt like Christmas. Christmas is still magic, even if your body is screaming to escape. When the presents were nearly all unwrapped, I sat down beside Rocco on the couch. He handed me a cardboard box, which had been left at his workplace, but with my name on it. He had picked it up on Christmas Eve when he was at the Macclesfield depot, dropping off his van for the break. This arrived for you. I assumed it was something he had ordered online. Usually he did all his Christmas shopping in one night in late December, staying up until two in the morning on Amazon, working through a list of names. I undid the tape and drew out a dark blue gift box, covered in gold stars. For me, I removed the lid and tipped the contents onto my lap. Falling from inside the box was a heavy ornament made of solid porcelain, surrounded in bubble wrap. I twisted it free, spinning the object out of its protective layers onto my knees. A delicate design, with hand-painted, picked-out wings and robes and a raised halo. Staring up at me was a luxury, ornamental angel Gabriel. The sight of him took me by surprise and I gasped, standing up and letting the figurine drop out of my lap onto the lacquered wood floor. The angel smashed into a dozen pieces. Lesser Light is an online event. Head to lesserlight.blog to join in the comments section or share this story on Facebook, Twitter, Hive or your favourite social media platform. 
The Lesser Light Paperback is available from Lulu.com or other booksellers, or you can download the ebook now. But remember, no spoilers until New Year's Day. The story is fictional, but if the elements about trauma, cults, or recovery have affected you, you can find helplines at lesserlight.blog.